Welcome to the Reology Podcast. My name is Scott Johnson. Now, I'm not a trained theologian, nor do I have degrees in theology or the Bible. I'm just a regular guy who loves and follows God, but wanted to know if there was more to what I was experiencing in the world of church. This podcast, it's the collection of a journey to dig much deeper in the realm of faith. And Reology, well, it's the study of the do-over, and it's founded on the philosophy and principle of stopping and thinking, especially when it comes to what I know about God, Jesus, and ultimately, what all of this has to do with me. Now, since writing and publishing the book, You Can't Get to Heaven If You Don't Go to Church, or so they say, God has brought people across my path to talk deeper about what they have read in the book and what they've come to experience for themselves in light of its foundation, which is the true understanding of the word and concept of ecclesia and the true understanding of the word and concept of church. These people have all embraced the idea of stopping what they're doing and thinking about why they're doing it. And of those people that God brought across my path, my guests today are from a ministry established to reaching college students. Tyler Korn and Chris Barron are the directors of the college ministry called Impact that exists on the campus of the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, or UNC Charlotte, or UNCC for short. So gentlemen... Welcome to the podcast, and thanks a bunch for being here. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, excited to be here. So, um, a few months ago, Tyler, <clears throat> you, you reached out to me. A mutual friend of ours had referred this podcast uh, to both of you guys. You took a listen, and then you texted you know, me to come and sit and have a conversation. And uh, I have been a part of Impact since its beginnings way back around like whatever, 2004 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it started by, you know, from friends of ours, Justin and Nathan. And its original direction was that of, you know, I mean, just a campus ministry. And then eventually kind of morphed into more like a church on campus. Um, um, of which you guys were both students at UNCC mm-hmm. and then members of Impact. And when we sat down, our conversation, you know, you, you pretty much pretty quickly caught me up to you know where God was leading you both and specifically that was into a very new direction for the ministry and which entailed some some pretty big changes not only for you know what the ministry would look like but also probably more importantly what you guys would be doing and how you would do that can uh, you guys you know take a minute a few minutes here to kind of talk about you know the, the history you know of impact like when you came in um, and then to the point of where you guys took over and where you felt like it needed to kind of move forward in a new and different direction. Yeah. So I, I, um, uh, entered UNC Charlotte, uh, in 2005, I got involved, um, through my brother and my, um, his friend, Josh, eventually my friend, Josh Edney. Um, I think it was the second year that impact existed is when I first started going to impact. Um, and Man, I, just, I really loved it. I know. I just dated myself. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, the students on campus don't think we're that old. We ask them all yeah, the time. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, the only thing that matters. That's it. Yeah, as long as we put a backpack on and you know. <laughs> right. Um. Yeah, but we we. I I, I loved it. Um. I got to know Justin and Nathan really well, and I loved how they um discipled, loved, challenged me, and um I really they really made my uh, Jesus really relevant to my faith for the first time. Mm-hmm. And by no means was I a great Christian student. I think there was a conversation they had one time. They told me this, that they would never ask me to be an intern um, just because I was not of that caliber. Uh, but eventually, you know, um, I started submitting more to the spirit, I guess. Um, I took my faith more seriously. And then they graduated around 2010. I, they asked me to be an intern. Um, and I eventually became, I went on staff up until 2015 when I left impact, um, to do something else. I, I, I started going to, um, I started leading help leading BCM at app state because they were doing a form of ministry that, um, was more aligned with what I wanted to do. Um, but eventually Justin and Nathan, you know, they, they told us. Tyler and I that, Hey, you know, Justin's going to start his church. 
um, or take over church, and then Nathan is going to take over or start his own practice and um, counseling. And they asked Tyler and I to come back um, to Charlotte to lead Impact. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and that's how very briefly, at some point I got married and now I have a kid. Um, I met my wife at Impact. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and then I eventually, in 2016, is when Tyler and I um, kind of took over the reins of Impact. That's my very brief history with Impact. Mm -hmm. And so, well, that, and that was when. So, 2016 was 16. the first year that Tyler and I were um, on staff together at Impact. Okay. Okay. So then, yes. from then, like, how long was it before you started? You know, thinking, wait a minute, this needs to change. Yeah. So, um, it it was not until I believe. So I think the first couple of years, it was, hey, let's make sure that we don't ruin the legacy of impact um, by just kind of keeping the boat afloat. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, Tyler and I had a lot of conversations of like, of what, how did God specifically gift us um, to lead a ministry? And what did God specifically call us how to do that on UNC Charles campus? <clears throat> and most of it, all of it revolved around what is like real discipleship look like. I think mm -hmm. Tyler and I um, both really valued that while we were students at UNC Charlotte. That's something that we we took away as um, one of the greatest things that Impact Charlotte did for us, Justin Nathan did for us, was the value of discipleship. Yeah. Um, so it was really, it took us about two years, right, Tyler? Two About two years? Yeah, but, I would but, say, yeah, it took, us, it took us about two years. Yeah. Two years to really say, okay, um, no more sacred cows, everything on the chopping block. Um, what will it, what would it take for us to say we are graduating disciples of Jesus that actually have a relationship with God and actually want to love others. Um, and that's when the kind of process began and shifted into a new direction. So, you know, I mean, you guys are working pretty closely together every day, so it's not like you have an office and then down the hall, you know, Chris's office down the hall, or you guys are working. I mean, I, you're pretty much working pretty closely, so I'm gathering and guessing, you can, you know, correct my assumption here, that you guys pretty much you came to this conclusion, you know, at the same time, not, you know, not one person was like, mm -hmm. hey, let's sit down and tell you something. It, you know, it's pretty much... I mean, am I right in that? It was a pretty much collaborative kind of a deal. I would like to hear Tyler's answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't I actually. Well, to, for or me did to or did somebody say, "Hey, uh, this is how I'm feeling," and have a sit down? Well, yeah, I think I think a part of Chris's story is that his his parents were missionaries in the mm -hmm. Philippines mm -hmm. on a college campus, doing <clears throat> what we're doing now, but years and years ago and so chris had already been hearing his parents basically chirp in his ear you know asking him questions about you know what is the gospel what is discipleship um and so he had this and that's why he you know he went up to app state for a year too because mm -hmm. um i think his his value of discipleship was a little bit different than what impact was valuing at that time um yeah yeah. And so yeah, so he he already had some I don't know some things that are that were changing in his heart right. before I was even in the picture. And when I was at Charlotte, like Chris said, like the most important thing was my relationships um, that were helping me be a disciple of Jesus. It wasn't so much all the events or all like you know the the Sunday service or whatever it was. It was that that life on life discipleship um, that was that was the biggest difference in my collegiate career. Mm -hmm. And then when when Justin and Nathan invited me to have a conversation about joining staff mm -hmm. um, from the very beginning, I didn't want to come, to come on to staff without Chris. I knew that if I was going to do it, Chris was going to have to be we were going to have to be a team. Yeah. Um, no matter who else was yeah. on staff, because I I trusted Chris. I had an idea of the direction that he wanted to go in. And it was and if, if I was going to be in ministry that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't have all the structure and the details in place, but I knew that God was calling me and Chris and I in a very different form of ministry on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I don't, Chris, I don't know if you need to add anything to that or not. Well, no, it's just, I think it was really, man, 
it was 100% God's providence um, that Tyler and I met each other in college. Um, and I, yeah, I love um, kind of doing life with Tyler. Um, and I think we both shared this heart for authenticity um, and not um, cheesiness. Mm-hmm. And I think we both, mm-hmm. we both grew up in a Christian, you know, upbringing. Um, and I think we both saw that, like, I don't, I don't know, part, part of our values today is like, we, man, we hate youth group culture. Right. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but just like mm-hmm. the, the, like, let's just get together and um, play games and have pizza. And like, we won't go into depth. We won't talk about real life issues and struggles right. because in college, like, man, our relationship really grew because um, there are a couple of us got together and we just love doing life and talking about real issues mm-hmm. and like exploring like who God is and asking hard questions. Um, and all was facilitated be- because of what impact was doing. Right. Um, but eventually I did. Um, I heard of like student led movements um, that my parents were doing in the Philippines that students were actually sharing their faith on their own, discipling on their own, hmm. um, creating these house churches on their own. And I was really interested in that. Yeah. Um, and Justin and Nathan, um, man, God bless them. They had so much patience with me. They should have fired me like, like three years into my, when I was on staff, um, because I really was very, I wanted to implement it at impact then. Yeah. Um, but it just wouldn't work with two visions and it was not, right, right. you know, I was not leading it. I was just right. help leading it. Um, so that's why eventually I led to, I left to go to Boone with App State because they were doing something different there for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, but so when I came back at Charlotte, um, I don't, I think Tyler knew a little bit of like, I think all Tyler knew was like, he just, he was just really good at loving students. Um, he really cared about students. And I think he really wanted students to graduate um, with the idea of like, man, this is actually who Jesus is. Right. Like he's not, he's not asking you to be guilty or ashamed. Mm-hmm. but they give you confidence and give you your identity. And Tyler was really good at that. Um, so that paired exactly with what, you know, what I wanted to do kind of, of like, like just make disciples, right? right. Just, what does it take for a student to love God and love others? Well, not because they have to, but they, for the first time are discovering who Jesus actually is. Yeah. So yeah, it was a perfect combination of man, just God's providence that brought us together and started mm-hmm. this new direction. Yeah. You know, and that's, um, <clears throat> I'm glad you said all that, which I knew you, probably would but it you know it's it's um there's a real difference and i think that's why you know i strive so hard to talk about the differences between ecclesia and church not that church is not a bad thing Mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a good thing and it's fine but it's man-made ultimately and ecclesia is not and um you know the grand plan that god had this whole time that came through jesus's sacrifice was Ecclesia, and it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's a, you know, realizing that God is not only real, but He is, you know, inviting, you know, us to, to, to join Him in what He's already doing in this world, and which is making disciples and, you know, being relational with people and and uh, not just thinking that hey, you know, okay, well, I, you know, I said yes to God. Now let's let's, you know, finish the journey by going to church. Um, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. which is similar to what you're saying is like, it's not graduate students, you know, Christian students, and now they can just go into the world and just go be church members. We got plenty of those. Mm-hmm. We need, mm-hmm. we need people who are going to make disciples instead. So, um, so when you started, um, really kind of, you know, dipping your toes in the water here and I mean, I, I mean, obviously, you're talking to your wives, you're talking to your good friends, you know, those maybe who are not directly involved in impact. So what's it look like then when you are starting to, you know, now we're going to have to implement this. We, we definitely have to talk to those who are, are, you know, the leaders and the, maybe the board or whatever that's, a, that's directly involved with impact. What that, what that process look like? Yeah. With the, with the board, it wasn't, there was really never this, I don't know, a struggle Mm-hmm. They they've always been great with with re- like respecting us and trusting us and just giving us the the room to say okay this is this is now you guys doing what God is calling you to do do it 
um, just do it well. They just wanted us to be faithful with what God was doing in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's really all we needed. That that doesn't mean they exactly understood everything that we were doing or the how or the why. Right. But I think from, yeah, the whole time it's been, we trust you guys that you guys are living a life with God. And if you're actually listening to him, then he's not going to lead you down the wrong path. And it may look different now than it did back then, but ultimately, like, <laughs> we trust you guys if you guys are trusting God. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, yeah, so we've never really had any any massive resistance with the board. They've been incredibly encouraging. Mm-hmm. But when we try to implement these things, or we, when we tried to implement these things with our student leaders then, and that's a completely different story. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, college students, we're obviously, you know, we're in collegiate ministry for the students. But man, 18 um, year olds really think that they know everything mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's that. I mean, uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Right that now. was a different story. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and it's, ahead, and it's funny, um, you know, uh, you think that, uh, you know, 70 to 80 year olds are the only people that, you know, don't <laughs> want to change. Um, yeah. So, okay. So the board, you know, acted just exactly like what a board is supposed to do. They don't need to know exactly all the little details. They just need to know you, mm-hmm. which is great. And they mm-hmm. gave you the blessing and support your student leaders. Not so much. Maybe all of them, maybe you wondered, did you have any that was like going, okay, I'll give us a whirl. So, so, yeah, um, so when I was at App State, it was the first year um, when, I, when I joined. It was the first year that they cut the gathering, the big gathering. And at that point, the BCM over there, I think they had like 100 students or something. Um, and then my first semester there, um, they, they, right before the, the spring semester ended, they said, hey, next year, there's no gathering. And that's how the year ended. Mm-hmm. Um, and 20 people returned to BCM. Um, and that whole year, it was just putting out dumpster fire after dumpster fire. Yeah. Um, because they kind of dropped the bomb. So I took that experience and said, Hey, let's not just like, you know, rip the bandaid off. What if we slowly kind of implemented like, or started like throwing out verses and go in the direction of like, what does it look like if the gathering isn't the main thing? What does it look like if you have the Holy spirit, you are capable, you're equipped and empowered to disciple your friends or just honestly have a deep conversation with your friend because you love them. Um, and that everything doesn't have to go through the institution of impact. Um, so we, we were trying to unravel it slowly. We had about how many leaders, Tyler, like 10. Yeah. I think at that point that, that, well, that <clears throat> summer was, was, I don't know, like six returning leaders and four mm-hmm. new ones. Yeah. Yeah. So about 10. Mm-hmm. Um, and, man what it was it went horribly <laughs> it was we were like we it was week after week just them saying but why are we getting rid of the gathering but why is the ga- why are we having all the lights on at the gathering like why are we having all these like it just they they couldn't understand that we just wanted them to know that hey you you have been empowered and equipped by the holy spirit um, that you don't, we're not asking you to be a leader at the gathering. We're asking you to be a leader outside the gathering. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was one by one, they kind of just quit. Um, wow. and we, man, we weren't asking them to do anything crazy. Right. Like looking back, they, Tyler and I, Tyler can speak on this in a second. Like we're constantly saying like, are we crazy? Are we incapable yeah. of communicating simple, like simple, um, vision? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, and and we haven't really talked about this yet, but I mean, it it is a, I mean, you, it is looking, it's going to look different, obviously. And you just said it, no gathering, which is obviously, you know, like your, you guys didn't have it on Sunday morning, but it's like the tip, it would be like equivalent to like the typical Sunday morning yes. worship yes. service where, you know, you mm-hmm. sing some songs and then someone teaches for 30, 40 minutes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um so, so the main, you know, one of the main changes is we're not going to do that anymore. Um, you know, that exactly. I mean, are you going to, I mean, you're, you're doing have some sort of gathering or no, what does that in, look in like? The, in the, so when we started to 
it all goes back to like us tr- using different language mm-hmm. with with the leaders and mm-hmm. it also goes back to us challenging them to what chris said like you are equipped with the holy spirit right like you can do this you can disciple your friends and share the gospel with your with your friends with your roommates with your classmates with the people that you just live life with mm-hmm. that is not the staff responsibility yeah. if you are a christian you are a disciple Right. And this is what discipleship is. This is what disciples do. It was from that moment, it yeah, that's when it got really, really hard. That's when students started to push back. And I don't blame them because their entire life, they've been taught being a Christian, I can just go to church and do the things and I can put the Christian hat on when I want to and take it off whenever I want to. Mm-hmm. But, we, but we, we ask students, okay, if that's what a Christian is, what is a disciple? And they say, oh, well, a disciple is somebody that's really committed. Hmm. Like they, they, they really know what's going on. Yeah. And that was really, that was really eye-opening for us. Yeah. That Christians don't, dis, don't consider themselves to be disciples. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that, that was like shocking to us. Yeah. So from the very beginning, like it was, we were always going to be like swimming uphill. Mm-hmm. Every single conversation that we had about this is this is how we're going to s- disciple you guys so mm-hmm. you can disciple your friends push back this is how we're going to train you guys just to share a simple gospel story from scripture and how that applies to your life push back yeah. um and that's when yeah once we started doing those things mm-hmm. students and student leaders started to yeah either quit or not to show up to things and so we started that first semester after using that language with our student leaders, mm-hmm. we had the gathering, but, but it looked, it, even that looks different looked way different because, yeah. yeah, because we weren't, we weren't considering that to be like the front door of what we did. Right. Discipleship is now the front door of what we do. Right. Students asking their friends if they're Christians or if they know Jesus, that's the front door. Um, and so we, we started the, the gathering for that first semester with, praying for our campus Mm -hmm. with talking about what the gospel is and how we're going to approach um, our friends with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And you would, you would think that Christians would say, okay, that makes sense. But the students that were coming to the gathering, like it was, (laughs) it just, they didn't want it for whatever reason. So we did start with the gathering. um, But I think the last gathering of the semester, Chris, there was like, I don't know, six guys there. Yeah, just dude, we six start- dudes showed up. <laughs> and we started the semester with like, I don't know, 45 students yeah. in a yeah. small room, which is not a ton. Right. But starting with 45 and we see 45 students in there, you know, and yep. just naturally it's like, okay, great. This is like a great base mm-hmm. to start off of. Mm-hmm. But then like, and you're like, okay, no, nope. leaders are starting to quit. Nobody's yep. showing up to the gospel. It's just these guys now. And so, like you said before, Scott, we start to ask ourselves, are we crazy? Yeah. Like, is this really what we're supposed to be doing yeah is this what god is actually telling us to do man but we always yeah. went back to scripture mm-hmm. and said okay if this is true god how are you directing us to do this on campus mm-hmm. and we still felt like god was calling us to do these things that we're still doing now and we even had you know the board was great we our wives <clears throat> are obviously amazing uh great encouragers and we had, you know, alumni and some students that when we ha- when we had these conversations, they were like, yes, this makes sense to us. But right. it was few and far between. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. It's funny because um, um, I, you know, I, I in the book I read a, a book that I've, I mentioned in my book and it's called uh, Jim and Casper Go to Church. And if you've, if you've mm-hmm. not read it before you're listening to this, you need to go out and get it because it's it's super eye-opening as far as like someone else's perspective on what we're doing, you know, every week, which is mm-hmm. like, you know, <laughs> the, the church never, you know, apparently wants anybody else's opinion about what they're doing every week. <laughs> every every other business and, pro- and a nonprofit mm-hmm. organization mm-hmm. in the known world does. But anyway, um <laughs> But it's basically, you know, this guy, Jim, is taking this a- atheist with him around to like 10 mega churches in the United States. Mm-hmm. And it's like, tell me what you thought. And his thoughts are exactly the same for every one of them except for one church. And it's it's considered a mega church um, just simply because it is a church. But their their front door is not a service at all. Um, it's like, 
you know, just, just one of the many things they do. And it's way down the list of priority of what they do. They actually own like a couple of city blocks and they mm. have this like, um, you know, their main, their main front door is, you know, going after, you know, the, the homeless and going after those who are in the margins and mm-hmm. helping them bounce back and giving them education and healthcare and just all this like incredibly, unbelievably restorative type of stuff. Right. But they mm-hmm. have a worship service and, you know, they're a mega church because of just the amount of people who are involved in the, in the, in the, you know, the, you know, church. I mean, it's kind of hard to call it a church because it's so different, but they have a service and they literally have about 60 people come to it. And it's so, you know, it's exactly what you're talking about when that's not the front door, the people who come don't really care. They don't care what it looks like as long as they're able to come and share and worship and those types of things, you know, genuinely and, and participate. Uh, but, um, yeah, yeah, you, you, we've we've talked before about the whole youth group youth versus youth ministry concept and mm-hmm. how they're drastically different. And you're absolutely right. There are so many youth groups, far more youth groups out there than there are youth ministries, mm-hmm. uh, who are just coming to college waiting for you guys to do everything for them. So I'm sure they did buck yeah. the system. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely that's definitely part of it. We're not anti-gathering either. It's sure. not exactly your story that you told. We want a gathering of people that like are they cannot wait to worship and pray mm-hmm. and hear the gospel together. Um, that's the whole like the word of ecclesia, right? Like that's right. the point of it. It's the called out people to come together and be reminded, um, so that they can go and live that life back to their own people. Right. And and we really said until that actually, like makes sense to us like we're not going to force people to come in a room mm-hmm. and feel awkward as they sing um with because we're not allowed to have amps on campus um and before there was always this like awkwardness how do we get over this awkwardness of people worshiping without an amp and they hear their own voice okay. well, what what if like we were we were actually like so excited to be with each other like that is not the first thought yeah right? the first thought is like i can't wait to worship with my brothers and sisters right, on right, campus right like, until that made sense we were going to push it yeah yeah, and at that point, it becomes a byproduct of what you're doing. You know, it's exactly. the result instead of the exactly. catalyst or whatever. So, so right. um, leaders on uh, maybe not so much on board. The board on board. <laughs> Students now, what's this look like? I mean, you go from 45 at the beginning of the year, you end up with five dudes. Um, <laughs> you know, so what does it look like in the last you know in the last year or two? Yeah. So so. Um, <clears throat> We had to redefine what success was for us. Mm-hmm. Um, if success really was not um, butts and seats and, uh, you know, uh, how, numbers, what was success? And for us, it is, are we um, are we obeying the way God's calling us? Um, and for us, that was just having students understand um, what a disciple of Jesus is. Not just a disciple of church or a pastor, but a disciple of Jesus. Um how can we empower and equip students for the next 40 years after they graduate that Jesus is actually um, meaningful enough to them that they are taking, they are actually have spiritual rhythms um, where they are reading their Bible, praying, worshiping, and they are actually loving their neighbors as themselves. They, they actually know how to share the gospel with others. Um, so that That's what we want success to be like. Um, so what that looked like was that we were just really, um, <clears throat> we started to, figure out what, what does, how do we define discipleship? Mm. Um, and what does it look like for us to disciple people? And it was just, so we started with a handful of people in these small groups. Um, and we just opened up the Bible and said, like, who is God? Who are you? Like, what are some goals you want to set? Um, and like next week get together is like, we worship, we say, Hey, did you do what you said you wanted to do? Um, and go through the Bible and really equip them to read the Bible for themselves and have a relationship with God. Um, that's not rely on us. Um, so it was very slow, um, but the fruit looked really different. Mm-hmm. Um, it bet. was, yeah, it was not sin management. It was not like, um, um, participation. It was very, very like eye opening because <laughs> I'm you know, sorry. No I love control. that phrase, man. Sin management is, is yeah, going to be one of my new favorite phrases. That's great. Mm-hmm, yeah, that's, it's yeah. great. 
yeah. So, I don't know. Tyler, you, you want to speak? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really eye-opening. Again, just I, got, I feel like I'm repeating myself at this point. Um, when we try to communicate these things with the students that we already had and it didn't click, we realized that we had to go out and find new students. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like we, we, yeah. we had to do the groundwork again. Yeah. Or really for the first time, because we kind of inherited, we obviously inherited the ministry and, um, you know, two years, two years on, and we were still, you know, reaping the benefits of what Jess, Justin and Nathan had already sown. But once kind of God was like, you know what, like these students are not for you. They're for somebody else. And mm-hmm. that's amazing. You mm-hmm. know, like if, if they don't like what we're doing, that's fine. No hard feelings. I mean, in those moments and those conversations of students telling us that, Hey, what you're doing is not in scripture. It's very hard to like, you know, look at, look them in the face and say, I still love you. Right. Um, sure. But once we, yeah, once, once God was making it really clear to us that, Hey, you just let me bring you to people, but you have to do the work, mm-hmm. you know, like you've got to put yourself out there. And so we started doing different things on campus. Um, and that's when I realized that I was, I was actually a missionary on campus mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I'm going into the city meeting with the locals to train and equip them to go yeah. back to their families, you know, their roommates and their yeah. classmates and all these. That's, that was really eye opening for me. And so my job description in a way kind of changed to not just living life with students, but also it gave me a purpose um, with the giftings that I, that I do have. And I'm very, very pastoral. Um, but at the same time, I'm an evangelist. Mm-hmm. And usually those things don't fit together. But right. in my head, like, I, I'm an evangelist to meet these students wherever they are, to see where they are in their relationship with Christ. And just, can we can we just take a step? You know, can, can I help you just lean a little bit more into your relationship with God? And that's the pastoral role. But we had to start from the ground up. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we started to do surveys on campus and this was before you know the pandemic so we were allowed to approach students without a mask on without any worry of you know am i going to get infected um and that was really really fruitful again what chris said it's a different kind of fruit because now we're asking students like hey this is what we are all about do you connect with any of this at all a lot of times we hear yeah but okay well then can we trade numbers no Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, then that's fine. But we are meeting students where they hear the words discipleship, share the gospel, not just want to be a participant at a church. You know, you see kind of like the light bulb flick on sometimes. And that's like, okay, we are where we need to be right now. So the majority of what we do right now is finding these, you know, quote unquote, people of peace that God is already preparing for us. Mm -hmm. He's just asking us, just put yourself out there, man, right. you know, right. and just trust that I am already ahead of you preparing the way right. so that you don't have to take on any of the, you know, the burden of trying to make it by yourself. Yeah. I'm already doing it for you. Yeah. You know, and um, David, my buddy Dave and I, in the last episode, we talked about this, which it's a reoccurring theme, honestly, it's, a, it's, it's control, you know, and, mm-hmm. yes. and when it comes to, and we've talked about this before, obviously, you know, in, Typically in American church, and I'm going to guess in most of the rest of the world, I don't know because I've not been there, but I would assume, you know, the model of church has been you go to church, let someone else do all the stuff for you because they're the only ones that are, you know, qualified yes. to do that. So, the you know, the minister slash pastor's role then becomes that of, you know, he's going to take care of me. And, mm-hmm. you know, the focus is really on is really more on him. And less on, you know, the, the Great Commission, which would be on me, you know, us. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think um, the one thing that I've I've thought of, of quite a bit over the last several years is this understanding of the willingness factor and and being moldable like clay. We've talked about that. Mm-hmm. And there's a big shift, as you said, Tyler, from, you know, being the, the pastor, you know, typical pastor of, hey, I'm going to. I'm going to, you guys come and I'll handle everything here. You're taking yourself out of that role willingly. Mm -hmm. It's scary to do obviously, but now it's, it's, it, 
you know, being able to like go and disciple someone and release them to the world, you know, in, in our culture, church wise, that's a really scary thought because most people think immediately, well, most pastors think immediately, oh, crud, they're going to go to another church, you know, Mm -hmm. instead of like, oh, great, they're going to be disciple makers and they're going to make 50 disciples. They're going to make 500 disciples. They're going to make 5,000 disciples. Um, And that is a huge, you know, obstacle for some people. Some people can, they'll never, ever even approach that idea because it's too scary. They may lose their job. They may lose their people to another church and they like Mm -hmm. feeling important, Mm -hmm. you know, and that the focus is on them. Mm -hmm. Um, But with you guys, obviously there is a a transition from that mentality to it's not about us. It's about what God's, as you just said, God's already doing it. He was already doing everything. He's preparing the way. He's just asking you to follow him into what he's already doing. If you're willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So what are things look like now? I mean, obviously we're in 2020 and the pandemic and all that stuff. What does this look like as far as the relationship? Because, you know, it is kind of contingent on being able Mm -hmm. to, you know, have a relationship with somebody. Um, What's it look like? this year yeah so so the great thing about um what we do and how we do it is that whether it's a pandemic or actual persecution or if they make laws against christianity it doesn't change the way our ministry is ran because it's so relational we don't need a building we don't need a million dollars we don't need a thousand dollars um it'd be nice but we don't need it right Mm -hmm. um as long as we're able to meet students anywhere everywhere we can um just ask them hey like who is god to you like do you believe like there's that god is more than just like um this western version of church or um you know being obeying him and this checklist of things like there's more than that and if they say yes we want to walk alongside of them and say like um just show them the jesus in the bible because most students never read the bible even Christians who grew up in the church, they don't, they've never really say, most, most read the people. Bible. Yeah, right. Yeah, most people, right? So for the first time, they're actually saying, like looking at who Jesus spent his time with, how he loved others, what he hated, um, and just challenge them to say, who in your life needs to hear this as well? Um, so we, because we're not asking people to come to a gathering, because um, on campus there is a uh, restriction. I think you can't have more than 10 people mm-hmm. gathering right. in a room. Right. Um, that is really... A, the biggest thing that's affected us is that we can't talk to as many random people as we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Um, But those who already are part of a ministry, we continue to challenge them um, and say, who are, who are the friends in your life that you need to share the gospel with? Um, Not because you have to, um, because you actually love them. Right. Um, And man, it's been, it's been awesome to see some students for the first time this semester, um, share the gospel with their friends. Um, just be challenged to start praying for the friends. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's to live the, the biggest life thing for us. Actually yeah, live it out. Exactly. <laughs> to live it out. Um, no matter what, um, external factors are happening in culture right. or around us. Like yeah. it's, and especially yeah, so, on a college campus. I mean, good grief. Yes. I mean, there's still, because of the pandemic, there's a lot of like depression, anxiety, and loneliness. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't have access to a lot of students. That is all real, and it's affected our ability to talk to people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't change our ministry. Right. Which is, you know, and we, we talked about this, that if you do have a ministry that's based on stuff when in, the, in the pandemic, like what we're in, you know, it, it typically has a tendency to like, you know, open it wide up, you know, and to, to show it for what it really is. And if your yes. ministry is based on stuff like that, you know, it, it it's, you, you can see right into it and you notice that it's, it is what it's built on and it's, and it, it does get seriously affected. Um, yeah. whereas like with this and maybe that, that's a kind of an interesting thing too, of like, you know, another way for people to disciple others is just being a, you know, your students being able to listen to someone who's having anxiety or fears or concerns. So, you know, now we got a vaccine. Should I take it? Should I not take it? You know, those are just the very basics of, you know, disciples and making disciples, you know, 
living life, talking about things, being vulnerable, like how you guys talked about how you did when you were students, you know, mm -hmm. opening up and allowing life to permeate each other and flow and ebb between each other. Um, so leader wise, what's, you know, where I know you guys are obviously still in the kind of the baby toddler stage of the ministry right now, but do you have leaders that you're looking at thinking, okay, these guys are going to rise up to be leaders or, um, what's that look like? How about you talk, Tyler? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> oh, crud. Well, I think, I don't know if we really, we don't, I don't think we think in terms of leaders anymore. Uh -huh. I think we, we have a, a decent grasp on who is in, you know, in our reach and who are, you know, who the students that we are already talking to, who they're talking to. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really look at leadership now. We really are just looking for disciples mm -hmm. and disciples live life with God, live life with others. And they, at the center of it is love, mm -hmm. you know? And I think though you, you, it's pretty clear to see those fruit, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, I was listening to, uh, this podcast with Francis Chan yesterday, and he said the biggest thing that he's learned over the past like I don't know five or six years was leadership is is defined by a lot of different ways, but at the heart of it, it's being humble. And I think for us, that's a really big thing. Of whenever we come into contact with a student, do they already talk about how they already know everything? Not that they get change change, and that you know, it's not to say that they're not a good person, but like we really are looking for students who are just willing to explore this idea. Like Chris said, like maybe everything that I've experienced before when it comes to church, like it's actually not true or God is potentially going to use me in a different way. And so we have, yeah, like I said, we have a really good grasp on where our students are. We, we know what they're doing because that's what we love to talk about. And we mm -hmm. challenge our students too. So we do have students that we work directly with, Right. Right. That we are discipling directly. We're in relationship with, but we're not in relationship with every student that we know yeah. because we have other students that are doing that as well with those people. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing for us is we're just trying to give leadership away. It's not for yeah. us. It's not on us. Right. And it's really not on our student leaders either. Right. Because leadership for us is not about attending something, being a volunteer, right, making right, sure right. you take all these things off the list. Yeah. Leadership is being a disciple yeah you know, natural. what a disciple do right yeah so yeah. yeah yeah it's it's crazy man scott once if once the church stopped actually like um defining terms right for mm -hmm. us a leader guess what if you're not leading anyone spiritually you're not a leader you're not it right? that like that's it like if you're not actually um discipling someone like we're not gonna like pretend you're a leader because you have this great charisma or you are always participating mm -hmm. or you're always around us. Like we, we can still be friends. We'll still like be part of our life. But like, mm -hmm. if you're not leading anyone, dude, you're not a leader. Great. Right, right. Like, and that's fine. That's not your fault. It's not anyone's fault. Like if you, if like multiplication, like that's what a great like churchy term, right? Yeah. But if, if it's not actually like starting new things that are starting new things, it's not multiplication. Right. right? It's addition. Right. You know, yeah. like, let's call it a disciple of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, not a disciple of the pastor, sure. the cult of personality you're following. Like, if you're saying that you can disciple people more than the Holy Spirit, that you rather have them come to you than release them to the Holy Spirit, and you haven't equipped them with the knowledge of who Jesus is in the Bible, and that you're, they're your disciple, not Jesus' disciple. Yeah. So, and, and I that's mean, a, so just like, yeah, go ahead. Define the terms. Yeah. Well, and that, that's the whole part of uh, stopping and thinking, right? I mean, we just use words all the time. We have we don't have the first clue what they really mean or where they came from. We just throw them out mm -hmm. there acting as if, like, that's the right thing to say. But mm -hmm. stopping and actually thinking through, which you guys are obviously right in smack dab in the middle of, you know, it's um, it's freeing because, you, you you know, the lights start coming on at that point. You can see things way clearer when you start mm -hmm. to do those things. So, mm -hmm. And we, we by no means have it all figured out. Sure. It sound it may sound like we do, but like I think we are constantly humbling ourselves and convicting ourselves. But I think the first step is kind of what you're saying is like what like let's actually like define some terms, like think about what we're saying, um, what's in the Bible. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, the first step is like admitting that we have a problem. 
So we admit that there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. um, we haven't found a solution, right? Right. But we're just like, hey, like let's continue to look at the Bible and what who Jesus really is. Yeah. Well, it's just that you're enlightened. God has revealed his things to you, and you've actually been in the position to accept it at that point and see it for what it is. And right. and he's still out ahead of you. You don't know where it's going. You don't know where he's going. Mm -hmm. But you know what you're doing. And that's right. the biggest difference. Um, you know what you're doing, and you're fine with not knowing where it's going because it doesn't matter. You you mm -hmm. you're, You feel complete because for the first time in your life, you know what you're doing. And, yeah. um, I mean, it's, it's clarity, but well, I appreciate you guys, um, you know, doing what you're doing, uh, as we've talked a couple of times and I've told you, I support you a hundred percent. I love what you're doing. I totally agree. You're right in the middle of where you need mm -hmm. to be. And, um, you know, when you allow God to do what he's wants to do and it's going to, obviously it's going to look completely different from what we think and expect and whatnot, but it's going to be way better. So, um, you know, I'm grateful for what you guys do and, and that you have the courage to be willing to go into the unknown. And, you know, as we said before, that's, that's why you're on this, this episode. I want other people to be able to see that it's, it's okay to step out and, uh, mm -hmm. question it's scary, but it's okay. And, um, mm -hmm. it can lead to where only God can go and what God's doing. So, Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciate you guys totally. So, well, uh, we have come to the end of this episode. Unfortunately, I want to thank my friends, Chris and Tyler for their time, willingness to share. Hey, if you guys like to take a closer look at what they're doing on the campus of UNCC, you can go to their website, which is impactcharlotte.com. Reach out to them. I'm sure they'd love to be able to share with you and continue to share with you what God's doing. And I'm sure they'd be super happy and thrilled to be able to encourage you along your way as well. I'd like to encourage you as well to be willing to rethink, research, and rediscover the mysteries of God, the life of Jesus, and the purpose of the ecclesia. Now, what I'm asking you to do, it's not an easy task, nor is it popular. Some might say, hey, just go to church and listen to the sermon and everything will be fine. Unfortunately, that's just not nearly enough. Take a hold of this faith in God with both of your hands. Claim it for your own investigate God, get to know him on a much deeper level, but just remember it all starts with a willing spirit to stop and think. If you spend any time learning about this Jesus in any of the four books dedicated to his life in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to quickly see that his message revolved around this very same mindset, stop and think. <laughs>